There are two things before we start this talk that you should know about me. <clears throat> I'm from Holland, so I'm Dutch. The second thing is I'm addicted. Well, to some of you this might not be a really surprising combination, but <laughs> I've been a user since, since I was four, actually. I've, I was forced upon it. And after a while, I must admit, I started enjoying it. When I was around 20 years old, I became a dealer, mostly dealing to children of like 9, 10, <laughs> maybe 11 year old. And now I'm producing this stuff, <laughs> analyzing it and see how you can refine it. So is it cocaine, heroin? No. It's education. You never forget your first class as a teacher. This was my first class on a tropical island somewhere in the Caribbean. This is me. I was still young, a bit naive. I thought I would be mainly teaching like happy kids and spend lots of my time uh, enjoying the sun and the beach and the ocean. But I have to admit I was, I was wrong. It was teaching under really difficult circumstances uh, with limited resources teaching children that had a lot of social problems. Killer, I remember a girl, Shuvi. She came in every day late, didn't have any breakfast, and always had this depressed look on her face. Also in the classroom, she wasn't paying much of attention, uh, seemed always a bit absent, not making her homework. And of course, if you look at it, as a teacher, you do everything you can to involve all of those children. You love them but I really struggled in involving Shuvi in education. In particular, I remember one time when I was sitting behind my desk after school time doing some work, and it was her time to clean the classroom and swipe the floor. And then, like many children do, she started chatting with me, and at a certain point, she was explaining what was happening at her home. She was living with her grandma, and she told me how people would come in at night, family members, friends, and then her eyes grew bigger. She said, I saw how they were swallowing very big grapes and then very large chunks of carrots because, she said, they were practicing. They were practicing to swallow packages of drugs to smuggle on their next flights to Europe. When I heard it, I have to say, my heart broke. I, I began to feel not only sad, but even even a bit hopeless. How can I, as a teacher, save such a kid? My colleagues couldn't help me, and I didn't know where to go to. And even today, when I'm sharing this with you, it still hurts a bit. I really regret it. Years later, I became a researcher. So as a researcher, you know, you first start reading and reading and reading a lot. What struck me actually was how much is actually written about topics like inclusion, inequality, access to education. All the things that I was facing on a daily basis as a teacher. For example, with Shuvi, all those insights, new ideas, never reached me in my classroom. Children like Shuvi never benefited from them. Nowadays, if you're a smarter teacher than me, a li little bit less naive, you go online, you go to a journal, a scientific publisher, and you want to access a certain study. What you will find is a publisher's paywall. Teachers have to pay on average 30 pounds to access, to download one article. To me, this is not only unfair, very unfair, and it's also very unwise, but in essence, it's really unethical. You're locking insights away from teachers that might improve the lives of children. Even the UN is actually quite clear about it in their Declaration of Human Rights. It states that everyone should freely share in the advancements of science. So locking teachers and all those children away from those advancements of science, from those insights. For me, 
it's nothing less than a violation of human rights. It also shows how big this gap actually is between educational research and its applications in practice. And what amazed me was that when I continued reading in the literature, people wrote about this gap already decades ago. So they knew about it, but they couldn't or wouldn't bridge the gap. Last year, when I arrived here in Cambridge, I, I rented a home, opened the door. It was really a mess. It, wa it was really dirty. It took us days to clean it. And I, in particular, I remember dusting, uh, vacuuming, and at a certain point, I wanted to give the floor a final sweep. So I grabbed a bucket, tried to put it in the sink, but it didn't fit. So I was tired. I decided just to take a break, maybe considering pouring cups of water in it or something like that. But then, like any 21st century citizen, I decided to Google for a solution. And actually, it was surprisingly simple. So this was on a site for life hacks. Hacking nowadays, of course, is associated with all kind of criminal behavior, but they emphasize that hacking in its original meaning is a good thing. You find practical solutions by not changing the whole system, but by using the tools that are available in a new creative way to solve the problem. So in this case, you're not going to replace the whole sink with a bigger one, but you just use your dustpan to fill the bucket. These hacks do not only apply to these minor issues, cleaning issues at home. They also apply to bigger issues. For example, air pollution. One of my favorite Dutch contemporary artists is Daan Rosengaarde. And he hacked air pollution. He built a beautiful, what he called, smog-free tower. The tower absorbs smog and then creates clean air bubbles of clean air for parks and for cities. And then he uses the waste, the smoke waste, the smoke particles. He puts them under very, very high pressure and creates smoke-free cubes. So they basically represent 1,000 cubic meters of clean air. Then he uses these cubes to create jewelry from them. So is there anyone here who's about to propose in the near future? <laughs> You're not going to tell me. <laughs> but if you want to compensate for your honeymoon flight to the Bahamas, this ring will do the trick. Dan Rosengaarde shows that looking differently at the world can help you solve problems in a very different way. And artists, I think, are masterfully in doing this. This also suggests that we should think differently about bridging this gap between educational research and practice. And I believe that a network view of the world will help us do so. So let me explain. A couple of years ago in the US, there was this red balloon challenge. They were hiding 10 big red balloons somewhere in the US. It was really everywhere, as you can see. They said the one that can locate them the quickest will receive $40,000 of prize money. And of course, a lot of teams signed up. A couple of days before the deadline, a team at MIT decided to give it a go. But they said, we're not going to fly helicopters around the US or study satellite images. What we're going to do is we're going to adopt a social network approach to solve this problem. And we're going to hack social media. So what they did is they broadcasted all over social media. If you can locate, point us to a balloon, a red balloon, you get part of the prize money. You also get $2,000. So of course, a lot of people started searching for it. And then they took it a little bit further. They said, if you can point us to a person that knows where a red balloon is, you also get $1,000 of prize money. Even if you can point us to a person that knows a person that knows where the red balloon is, you get part of the prize money. In this way, people started searching for red balloons and people that knew where the red balloons were. And their search capacity, of course, increased when people were twittering it and putting it on their Facebook. 
at a certain point they estimated that this small team of just five researchers now had over a million people searching for those red balloons. An incredible increase of their search capacity. So did it work? Yes, it did. They won the challenge. But what's even more astonishing is, in the time they did it, they located the 10 red balloons. Eight hours, 52 minutes and 41 seconds. Just a day of work. It shows the huge potential and the huge power of looking differently at the world. Adopting a network perspective, hacking the tools that are available and to solve problems. Now, let's go back to education. What would happen if you would exchange these search networks for research networks? And what if those 10 big red balloons were the big issues in education about access to education, about inclusion, about inequality, and all the other issues that teachers are facing in their classrooms? For example, one of the schools that we're working with they were very successful in growing these networks within their school by hacking their performance management system. They simply replaced the performance goal for a research question. All teachers in school were reading literature, were collaborating with colleagues and researchers to study these topics, and in the end of the year, they discussed the outcomes with the school leadership team. A total shift of culture. We take snapshots of this organization. So our first snapshot that we take is we do a survey and ask people like, who do you collaborate with when you do research? And who do you discuss research findings with? And we can then draw network maps that show like how many people are involved and connected to each other. And in the beginning, sometimes it looks like this. Just a few people are involved in research. Many people are outside. But then when people in school start hacking their systems, they can build research networks very, very quickly. And what you can see is that even after a year, it can look like this, a very dense connected network, people using research, discussing research, trying to improve their practice with the research findings. Is it all worth it? There is no prize money attached. A while ago, I spoke to a teacher and she was really struggling with one of their students that was new to their class in the beginning of the year. She said he came in and he looked so depressed. It reminded me a bit of Shuvi. She said he was obviously traumatized at his other school, bullied. He didn't even dare to speak to me or to the other children. He was performing way below his grade level. But then she said, I went, went back to the research that I've been doing in school. I've looked into the research literature and started to design together with my uh, colleague an approach that could help him. And she said he started to feel more comfortable at school. He felt more safe. They built up his social skills. And she said a couple of months ago, you could already see that he was feeling so comfortable, we decided to look at his performance again. And now he was already at grade level again. Just last week, he said, like all our students, he had to present about his learning journey this year. It was a big thing to him. His parents were there, teacher were there. You could see, he said, he was obviously very nervous. But he had the courage. He stood up, presented about his special, difficult learning journey this year. And in the end, he started crying when he finished. He said, I can't believe that I've just presented for you. His parents were in tears. Teachers started to cry as well. She said, this is what teaching is all about. This is also what bridging the gap between educational research and practice is all about. Improving the learning opportunities for these children improving their lives and their futures. And therefore, we need to create these research networks. We need to bridge this gap between educational research and practice. We need the creative minds of the artists, like Daan Rosegaarde. We need those creative thinkers in education as well, that can hack 
the systems, education. It really is good stuff. <laughs> but please, don't leave educational research just to the scientists. We need creative teacher hackers. Thank you.